this is the Youth Bible with Nick and Pippa Gumbel, day 113. We know that God has a plan, and that plan is good for our lives as well as the world, but how does he involve us in this plan? How does he give us the freedom, but also remain in control? It can be a confusing paradox, so let's look deeper into the Bible passages for today and try and figure out the answer. Things happen to us. So much of life is simply the set of circumstances we find ourselves in. For example, our parents, our genetic design, the weather, much of our education and our government are all things that we experience as happening to us. In Greek grammar, these things are expressed in what we call the passive voice. However, we also make things happen. When I initiate an action and do something, this is expressed in the active voice. But Greek grammar also has a third voice, the middle voice. This is neither wholly active nor wholly passive. When I use the middle voice, I am participating in the results of an action. Christian prayer is spoken in the middle voice. It cannot be in the active voice because it's not an action I control as in the ritualistic pagan prayers where the gods do our bidding. Prayer is not in the passive voice either in which I'm at the mercy of the will of gods and goddesses. In Christian prayer, as Eugene Peterson puts it, I enter into an action begun by another, my creating and saving Lord, and find myself participating in the results of his gracious action. In one sense, the whole of the Christian life is prayer. We welcome God's gracious hand in our lives, and we participate in what he is doing in the world. God involves you in his plans. Of course, he could do it all on his own, but he chooses to involve you. He gives you freedom, but he remains in control. From Psalm 50. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. God will deliver you. For millions of people around the world, the COVID-19 epidemic has been a day of trouble. Now, Afghanistan, Ukraine, humanitarian crises, economic hardship. What about you? Are you facing trouble in your life? Worry about your health or the health of your loved ones? A stressful situation at work, a difficult relationship, a financial challenge? God is in utter control of his universe. God the Lord speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. He owns everything. We may fight and struggle for our little corner and possessions, but in the end, God owns it all. Every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. He is not dependent on human beings. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all that is in it. Nevertheless, he graciously gives you a part to play. First, thank God. Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Second, call on God. Call upon me in the day of trouble. Third, honor God. I will deliver you and you will honor me. I have come back many times to Psalm 50 verse 15. I've called out to the Lord in the day of trouble. It's amazing to look back and see how often his gracious hand has delivered me. Lord, thank you so much for all the wonderful answers to prayer. Now I call upon you again to deliver me. New Testament from Luke 22. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And he took the bread, 
gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked you to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Your prayers make a difference. Are you sometimes tempted to compare yourself with other people? It's encouraging to see that Jesus' disciples struggled with many of the same things that we do. There is bickering among the disciples over which of them would end up as the greatest. It's always a temptation to compare ourselves with others. This either leads to pride, if we think we're doing better, or jealousy, envy and insecurity, if we think we're not doing as well. Jesus points out that the values of the kingdom are the polar opposite to the world. Kings like to throw their weight around, and people in authority like to give themselves fancy titles. It's not going to be that way with you. Let the senior among you become like the junior. Let the leader act the part of the servant. I've taken my place among you as the one who serves. As we look at the parts played by each of the people in this drama, we see once again that the Bible teaches both predestination, that God has planned everything in advance, and free will. This is a mystery that the scriptures hold in tension, and we are rightly suspicious when any human system attempts to explain it away one way or the other. In this passage, we see three examples of how this tension operates in practice. First, Judas. We see here a terrifying description of how evil works. No one is immune from temptation. Judas is one of Jesus' chosen 12, yet Satan enters him. Jesus says, that all this was foreknown and indeed predestined, the Son of Man will go as has been decreed. But the fact that it is foreknown and predestined does not absolve Judas of responsibility, but woe to that man who betrays him. The paradox is that although it has been decreed, Judas is a free agent. Judas' will was involved. When he was offered money to betray Jesus, Judas consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over. Second, Simon Peter. The same Satan who entered Judas wanted to sift Peter as wheat. Peter was very confident that he would not let Jesus down. Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus knew that Peter would fall. I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. But ultimately, his faith did not fail. Jesus said, But I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. This shows that in the midst of this extraordinary paradox of predestination and free will, prayer really does make a difference. Why and how it works, we may never understand. However, the example of Jesus shows that it really does count. Your prayers do make a difference. Third, Jesus supremely in the life and death of Jesus, we see this paradox of predestination and free will. Jesus says the Son of Man will go as it has been decreed. He says it is written, 
and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. There could not be a stronger statement that Jesus' death was preordained, preplanned, and predestined. Yet, Jesus went willingly to his death. He chose to die. He gave his body for us. We see the balance between God's part and our part. We are reminded of it every time we take communion. Jesus said, this is my body given for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That was the hard part, the sacrifice of his life voluntarily given for us. Our part is relatively simple. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you that you've done all this for me. Thank you that you gave your body and shed your blood for me. Thank you for your gracious hand in my life. Old Testament, from Joshua 3 to 5. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan. God will do amazing things. Do you realize that God is with you? And if God is with you, then you can face every challenge that lies ahead. God says to Joshua, I am with you as I was with Moses. Again, we see here the balance between our part and God's part. First, prepare yourselves. God was about to act in a miraculous way on behalf of his people, but the people themselves had a part to play. Joshua tells the people to prepare themselves, sanctify yourselves. Tomorrow, God will work miracle wonders among you. They were also given the task of choosing people to play particular roles in preparation for the crossing of the Jordan. Second, provision of God. We see again the gracious hand of God. The Lord did amazing things. One of these amazing things was the crossing of the Jordan. God promised to exalt Joshua. Joshua did not exalt himself. But that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. He provided for all the people's needs. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. God provided as much as they needed and no more. This kept them from material security and self-sufficiency and perhaps from not trusting in God. Your security and trust must be in God alone. He has always provided enough, but no more. Thank you, Lord, for the astounding way in which you involve me in your plans. I consecrate myself to you today. Thank you that you promise that you will do amazing things in me and provide for all my needs. Pepper adds, in Luke 22, verse 24, this theme of being the greatest keeps coming up. The disciples were jostling for power. It seems so inappropriate when disaster was about to strike. They should have been getting instructions from Jesus. At this stage, it didn't look as though any of them would become great leaders, but they did. This gives hope to us all. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you gave your body for me. Thank you that you work in my life. And thank you that you died on a cross for me. Help me to trust in your plan and to be a part of it and to take action in this world. I pray these things in your name. Amen. <laughs>